good time of day to you, Splice Strategists, and welcome to the terror of Operation Disco Action, which really sounds like a bad panic at the Disco cover band. Now, terror missions are different from any other missions you've seen thus far. First off, no meld. We have enough to worry about without having to collect meld. Secondly, as you can see here, there are random Mumbai citizens scattered throughout the map. The aliens' goals are to murder them. Simple enough. Our goal is to save them. What is the reward for saving them? Well, the more citizens you save, the more panic goes down in the country the mission is in. Save enough citizens, and you even have panic go down in the rest of the continent. And the last time we checked, uh, Asia was not pleased with our performance, so this is a great opportunity to get them to shut up. So the way that you rescue a citizen is by having a soldier stop right next to one. We can then instruct them to run to the Sky Ranger. For some reason, they can't decide to run to the Sky Ranger on their own, and we can't tell them from two squares away. You have to be right next to them. I don't like what this has to say about citizens. Apparently the TV trope Too Dumb to Live is in effect. Now, in terror missions, information is key. You need to know where the enemies are, because there are some very scary enemies in terror missions. So, we throw Jimmy's little battle scanner into this, uh, government building or something. I don't know. It has fancy Greek columns. It screams government to me. And on the alien's turn, you all get to meet the Chrysalid. Chrysalids are two parts Starcraft Zergling, one part Face Hugger, and seven parts the total doom of your team if you make a mistake. Luckily for us, we know where they are, but they don't know where we are thanks to the Battle Scanner. Thanks, Battle Scanner. You're welcome. So, right now, they're moving about aimlessly looking for citizens to murder. Now, the first thing you need to understand about facing chrysalids is the zergling part of them. They are very fast and only attack in melee. The second part of them, the facehugger part, is that whenever they kill someone, they plant an egg on that person. On the next turn, that body will rise up like a zombie and then will sort of shamble its way towards you and try and kill you with a melee attack. Zombies have a lot of hit points, so it takes like two or three shots to take them down too. Which that then brings us to the doom part. If you don't kill a zombie quick enough, the egg inside the zombie will hatch and you'll have another chrysalid on your hands. I think you can see how this can quickly snowball out of hand. Right now, we don't have the chrysalids attention because they haven't seen us. And I don't want them to start going after citizens, laying eggs, and creating even more targets for us to shoot down. So I move Beedober up and open this door. Just as when the aliens open doors and break windows, we hear it. It's a two-way street. When we open doors and break windows, they hear it. And the chrysalids will hopefully respond by running back towards us instead of killing citizens and creating zombies. Next, Gemini learns that social interaction is difficult for hulking cyborgs. Remain calm, civilian. We are here to save you. The aliens are attacking us with robot people! Ah! Wait, come back. I just wanted to be your friend. Commence sulk subroutines. But there is no time for sulking, as our gateway ajar gambit has paid off, and the chrysalids are zerg rushing in to see what the ruckus is about. That leads to Vito Burr missing his overwatch, Jimmy doing 5 damage, and Citrus missing his overwatch. Was really hoping to kill one of these bugs with those three shots. Some other aliens killed more civilians in the fog of war, and it's time to deal with these bundles of terror in front of us. Now, we saw one of the chrysalids jump up to the second story, and we can't see him. But thanks to his buddy down here, he can see us. And when you're dealing with threats that can one-hit kill you, that's bad. Oh, d did I mention that they can one-hit kill you? I didn't? Well, uh, yeah, they can do that, so... fun. Now, as Beedober is close enough to kiss the bug, he can obviously kill it. But that's a big risk. Why? For this, I'm going to freeze the video and do some long form explaining. Like us, the bugs can choose to move twice or to move once, then attack. Because they are melee threats, they have to move right next to us in order to get their hacks one hit kill and zombify us. So if we kill the one right next to us, the other threat is the one that we can't see. But we know he's somewhere up there and would like to drop down here and be in range of Beedo Burr and Citrus. So we either want Beedo Burr and Citrus to be too far away for that bug to eat them, or we want to kill the bug that's right in front of us, then shuffle Beedo Burr and Citrus around so that the unseen bug has to guess where they might be rather than know where they might be. This leads us to Splice Strategies Axiom number 17. 
If you're facing melee threats, don't stand still unless you can kill them all. For that reason, we move Beedober far away from the unseen bug, and now we have to take care of the seen bug. While some might say they don't make Flyswatters big enough for insects this large, Gemini Spark respectfully disagrees. Bug off. Puns aside, Citrus wasn't too keen on having heavy caliber rounds fired right over his shoulder. Plus he doesn't want to get eaten, so he observes Axiom number 17 and moves back so the chrysalid will have to guess at his location. Likely, the bug won't come directly at us now, but we have to be prepared with overwatches. And sure enough, it does move. And Beetlebur misses. And Citrus Architect misses. And Jimmy does minimum damage. And Sucre does minimum damage. When it comes to a bug hunt, Starship Troopers we ain't. After that, two floating friends decide to come and join in on the fun. And two more after them. Wow, this has escalated quickly. So we're now in a 5-on-5 five -five fight, and 5-on-5 five -five fight is really hard to say. As always, when you're facing a lot of aliens, you gotta slow yourself down. What's the biggest threat? Despite not being right next to our soldiers, the biggest threat is still the chrysalid because if he eats that human there, we'll have a zombie on our hands. And zombies have more than two times the hit points of a single floater. So we move Citrus Architect up and have him administer some laser-guided insecticide. With our pest control problem now solved, we worry about the floaters. Now, there are three floaters that could shoot at us, but effectively, there are only two. Why? Because of that citizen we just quote-unquote saved from the bug. You see, in terror missions, the enemy will go for the easiest shot. Citizens have no armor, so they will almost always be the easiest shot. So despite us killing the chrysalid, this human is pretty much doomed. But hey, at least this human is dying for a good cause, preventing our valuable soldiers from taking any damage. And this leads us to the longest of all spry strategies axioms, number 22. In terror missions, citizens are either bug food, a blade of armor, or safe. Prevent the first, settle for the second, try for the third, and do it in that order. So first, we try to get rid of the only floater that won't have line of sight to the decoy, I mean citizen. No dice. Since we now know that this one will be a problem next turn, we use Beedober's suppression to make sure that whatever shot it takes will be a bad one. We then use DJ Sucre's suppression to lock down the next closest floater. And though we have no more suppressions, we can use Gemini's Overwatch to dissuade any floaters from moving up closer and trying to get any flank shots. And now it's time for the flock of floaters to take their actions. The closest one takes a bad shot at DJ Sucre. The floater off by the filing cabinets hides even further. The far left floater takes a bad shot at Beetle Burr, I love suppression. And the fourth floater stays where it is and dusts the poor blade of Citizen. Avenge me! And avenge you we shall, nameless citizen number 14. Jimmy, avenge him! Gemini, avenge him! I... Gemini, I said... Well, that's not good. Because Beedo Burr and Sucre are out of ammo. And the only shots I have left are Citrus and then Sucre has a rocket. And I don't really want to fire the rocket because even though they're 90% accurate, if it veers off course and hits the doorway, I'll strike both Citrus and Gemini and do no damage to the floaters. But I sort of kind of gotta fire the rocket if I'm gonna kill these two floaters here, so I'm going to lessen my risk by using Run and Gun to rush Citrus Architect past these floaters and dodge the other floaters overwatch. Yeah, uh, up the stairs and drop down, why not? I'm sure that was quicker than just hurling over the desk. Now that Citrus has moved, if the rocket does misfire, the only person who will get hit is Gemini, and he's got plenty of HP. Take it like a man is still an unacceptable strategy. Oh, quit complaining, Gemini. You were just shooting over Citrus's shoulder and you didn't hear him whining. Besides, DJ Sucre probably won't miss anyway. Right, Sucre? Yeah! See, you were worried over nothing. With those two down, we move Citrus up to make sure the other floater isn't in Overwatch, then charge on in with Gemini to get the last kill with the flamethrower. Though this civilian isn't going to like how close Gemini is cutting it with the napalm. Do not be concerned, citizen. I am a professional. And with that, we put an end to Mumbai's terror and saved 13 of 18 civilians. Though we had off-target Overwatches, 
through the use of distracting doors, superb suppressions, pinpoint projectiles, and sacrificial citizens, oops, we were able to not only complete the terror mission, but got through it without a single HP of damage. Operation Disco Action? More like Operation Disco Inferno, because boy did we burn baby burn. And holy quadruple promotions, Batman! Now that's what I'm talking about. Let's start with 06 Jimmy. Our choices are both good at Captain for a sniper. Executioner gives us better aim at targets with lower health, making Jimmy a kill shot specialist. Opportunist, on the other hand, lets her crit on reaction shots and eliminates the reaction shot penalty. Critting on an Overwatch is something no other class can do, so my choice is Opportunist. Nextly, which I think is a word, 08 Citrus Architect is now a lieutenant, and like Jimmy, he has two good options. Flush lets us use an action to force an enemy to leave his cover. Rapid Fire, on the other hand, lets me fire two shots at once at a slight penalty. Flush is useful for blockade busting, but I sort of already have blockade busting covered with lightning reflexes. Rapid Fire is something that we can use to make sure something dies by getting up close and shooting it twice. This is something that is great now and throughout the rest of the game, so we're going with Rapid Fire. Zero One DJ Sucre is also a lieutenant. Now, his choices can both be awesome as well. Though the way I set him up, I feel my choice is obvious. Heat Ammo confers 50% more damage versus robotic units. Robotic units are some of the most brutal in the game, so extra damage is good. Rapid Reaction, on the other hand, can let him shoot an Overwatch shot twice if he hits the first one. Rapid Reaction can greatly increase your offensive output, especially against melee threats that are charging at you. But I use Suppression a lot, which chews through a lot of ammo. If I had Rapid Reaction on top of that, I'd fear I'd be reloading every other turn, so heat ammo it is. Zero 09 Gemini Spark finally has received his promotion to Corporal. Advanced fire control would make it so his overwatches wouldn't receive the reaction penalty, though automated threat assessment would give him 15 more defense when in overwatch. Two very good choices. But as you know, I'm almost all about defense, so I'm going with automated threat assessment. And hip hip hooray, we get another Cherno Alpha badge. And does the good news stop? No, because panic has gone down in India by three and in all of Asia down by one. By Firaxis Hammer, what a relief. So we scan and our excavation's complete. I want to start construction on the Xeno containment unit, but I don't got the dough. So we go through yet another fire cell, get some spending money, and blow it all on the ET detainment facility. Then we scan some more, and our thermal generator completes. So much like He-Man, we have the power. Scan again, and our satellite uplink completes, so we now have the room to launch three more satellites. But we don't got no satellites to launch yet, so we scan some more, and our three satellites complete. So now we need to launch them. The first two choices are obvious. Argentina and Brazil get their satellites to get them to cool off and stop burning effigies of me. And we now have the We Have Ways bonus, which makes all autopsies and interrogations research projects complete instantly. If there were Ekakam Angels, this would be the moment they start singing. Our next choice isn't as obvious. You'd think I'd put it in North America since they are next closest to riding, but if I put it in North America, then I'd have to send a fighter craft there, and that costs both money and upkeep, Negative. greatly that cutting into how much cash I'd get this month. Team. For that reason, I put it in Japan, since that gets me one closer to Asia's awesome bonus, avoids the extra cost of building another fighter, and makes sure all our bootlegged anime will be protected from the alien mess. Next, we scanned, and our taser research completes. Now that we have the We Have Ways bonus, I start in all the plethora of autopsies that are waiting in the queue. This is going to be a research dump that normally would take somewhere between two weeks and nearly a month. This is what we call a time savings. Sectoid Autopsy gives us UFO targeting, which will guarantee our first two shots against a UFO will hit. The Thin Man Autopsy gives us a poison grenade option, and a new gene mod that we'll get into in a later episode. Chrysalid Autopsy gives us the option of some melee armor, needle grenades, and a gene mod that we'll get into in a later episode. And Seeker Autopsy gives us a respirator implant option, a grenade that can turn people invisible for a turn, and, you guessed it, a gene mod that we'll get into in a later episode. After that, we start researching alien materials, which will give us a chance to start some armor research at a later date. With all our science fair projects all done, 
We go to scan, and it's time for the end of the month council report. And boy oh boy, are Lex Luthor and the Legion of Doom happy with us or what? They are giving us another scientist, four more engineers, and a lot of dough. Please note the difference that four satellites and Africa's all-in bonus makes compared to what we got last month. With our newfound cash surplus, we go to the engineers and get them to build four Reaper rounds to fulfill the UK's request. By spending 75 double S's on these rounds, they will give us back 165 double S's. This is a sound investment strategy no matter how you slice it. Next, I start building a genetics lab so that we can begin to truly make this a spliced strategy. Next, we begin access lift construction so that we can keep building more rooms. And as we scan again, we have completed the construction of the Xeno containment unit. And if you haven't figured it out yet, I call it the Xeno containment unit because it sounds like ecto containment unit and I love Ghostbusters. I even have the jacket to prove it. I then remember to build the UFO dodge and UFO targeting stuff so that the next time I fight a UFO I won't go in naked. I scan and Alien Materials finishes, so I can now build a bulletproof vest for my soldiers if they want that instead of a grenade. My next research choice reflects my usual concern of the next thing that can kill me, an even bigger UFO than the last, so we're going with heavy lasers. That's when I finally recall that Jimmy got promoted to captain, so we're now allowed to go to the officer training school and buy squad size 2, allowing us to bring a grand total of 6 soldiers on a mission. Slammin'. That also reminds me I got a Cherno Alpha badge and need to award it, so we're giving it to our favorite constructor of fruit, 08 Citrus Architect. It's about then that a large UFO decides that it doesn't want to bother with fighting our fighters and just waltzes into Nigeria like it owns the place. That reminds me that I never actually sent any ravens into South America. Wow, sure glad the UFO didn't decide to attack there. I probably would have been a satellite down, dodged that bullet. Regardless, we are now sending the full complement of six soldiers on this mission. So we dust off Eva Lemison, give her a laser rifle and the taser, remind her not to use them on any of her teammates, and we're off to evict the UFOs squatting in Africa. Oh, jeez. It seems Bobby Percival is going through a Lincoln Park phase or something. Could someone get him some Huey Lewis in the News or maybe a Jack Johnson CD? Because I don't want any more mission names that sound like we're about to break up with our girlfriends and wear mascara. In any case, tune in next week as I hope that none of my soldiers go on suicide watch during Operation Dark Angst. Until then, I'm Splice, and in the end, it doesn't even matter.